Organizational Attitudes and Behavior, Chapter 10, from the book Psychology Applied to Work, An Introduction to Industrial and Organizational Psychology, 10th edition by Dr. Paul M. Muczynski, and narrated by Dr. Carlos Andujar Rojas. Learning Objectives Explain the organizational attitudes of job satisfaction, job involvement, and job commitment. Understand the concept of organizational justice. Understand the concept of organizational citizenship, behavior, and its relationship to other concepts. Understand the concept of the psychological contract in employment and its changing nature. Understand the concept of organizational politics. And finally, understand the basis of organizational deviance. Traditionally, industrial and organizational psychologists dealt with rational, logical, and cognitive aspects of work behaviors. After the famous Hawthorne studies, EO psychologists learned that besides the rational aspect, the affective and social components are also very important factors to consider in order to grasp the big picture of organizational behavior. Work attitudes. Work-related attitudes are relatively enduring evaluations that individuals have of various aspects of employment, including their employers, their boss, and the job they hold. These attitudes can vary in both intensity and favorability, and they also influence individual behavior. One of the work-related attitudes that capture most of the attention of EO psychologists is job satisfaction. Job satisfaction is the degree of pleasure an employee derives from his or her job. It is an effective reaction to a job based on the comparison of the actual outcomes derived from the job with those outcomes that are expected. Feelings of job satisfaction can change with time and circumstances. Although some employees derive great pleasure and meaning from their work, many others regard work as drudgery. Individual differences in expectations and in particular the degree to which mix one's expectations. There are broad differences in what people expect from their jobs and thus broad reactions to them. Some people find their job dissatisfying because they have to exert great responsibility. Meanwhile, others may find the same type of job very satisfying. Why people differ in their preferences of job outcomes is positive to be related to their developmental experiences. Research has revealed that people develop overall feelings about their jobs as well as about selected dimensions or facets of their jobs, such as their supervisor, co-workers, promotional opportunities, pay, and so on. EO psychologists differentiate these two levels of feelings as global job satisfaction or job facet satisfaction, respectively. Considerable research has been devoted over the years to the measurement of job satisfaction. The Job Descriptive Index has been used to measure job satisfaction for more than 40 years, and this is regarded with professional esteem within EO psychology. Likewise, the Minnesota Satisfaction Questionnaire is highly regarded within the profession. A version of the Minnesota Satisfaction Questionnaire is shown in slide 3. To analyze job satisfaction in a broad spectrum, it has to be related to the concept of affect. Affect refers to a fundamental difference in how people view life, their general disposition and attitude. 
Affect is typically described along a positive negative continuum. People who are high in positive affect tend to be active, alert, enthusiastic, inspired. Other factors to be taken into consideration are the objectives, conditions of the job, aspects such as level of pay, hours of work, and physical work conditions are considered objective conditions. They can be evaluated by the workers and they can decide if they are adequate by means of consensus. Both affect and objective job conditions leads to an assessment or interpretation of job circumstances which also leads to the perception of job satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Based on the information discussed, Brief 1998 proposed the model of job satisfaction that you can see in slide number four. The relationship between job satisfaction and job performance has been researched for more than 50 years. However, the relationship between satisfaction and performance is not very strong. Meta-analytic studies report a correlation coefficient of 0.17. A recent study by Thorensen in 2001 reported a correlation of 0.30 between both variables. Its implications is that organizational attempts to enhance both worker satisfaction and performance simultaneously will be likely to be unsuccessful. The reason is that the two concepts are only mildly related. The relationship between job satisfaction and withdrawal behaviors has also been studied. The magnitude of the relationship between satisfaction and turnover on average is about negative 0.40. However, this relationship is influenced by several factors, including the availability of other work. People would rather endure a dissatisfying job than be unemployed. Conversely, when alternate employment is readily available, workers are more likely to live on satisfying jobs. The correlation between job satisfaction and absence is considerably smaller, approximately negative 0.25. Absence from work can be caused by many factors like transportation problems and family responsibilities among others. Job involvement is the degree to which a person identifies psychologically with his or her work and the importance of work to one's self-image. The opposite of involvement is alienation from work. The quality of one's entire life can be greatly affected by one's degree of involvement in or alienation from work. A state of involvement implies a positive and relatively complete of engagement of core aspects of the self in the job, whereas a state of alienation implies a loss of individuality 
and separation of the self from work environment. In meta-analytic studies, on average, a correlation between job involvement with job satisfaction is 0.45, negative 0.09 with job performance, negative 0.13 with turnover, and 0.53 with personality dimension of consciousness. As you can see in the slide 5, there is a sample of items from the job involvement questionnaire. In these items, as you can see, the construct also relates with work as a central interest of one's life. Work commitment is the extent to which an employee feels a sense of allegiance and loyalty to one or more targets within the sphere of employment. The targets can include one's occupation or profession, the employing organization, a work team, or a particular component of one's job. Allen and Mayer, 1990, proposed three components to this construct. The affective component, which refers to the employee's emotional attachment and identification with the target. The continuous component refers to commitment based on the cost that the employee associates with leaving the target. The normative components refers to the employee's feelings of obligation to remain with the target. The normative component refers to the employee's feelings of obligation to remain with the target. The loss of security in the contemporary workplace threatens why employees would commit to their organization, thought downsizing outsourcing, offshoring, etc., employees can lose their jobs through no fault of their own, thereby weakening the basis of being in a committed relationship. Based on meta-analytic studies, the average correlation between organizational commitment and other work-related constructs are similar to the patterns found in job involvement, only stronger. The average correlation were 0.53 with overall job satisfaction, negative 0.25 with turnover, and 0.67 with the personality construct of consciousness. Other studies show correlations of 0.50 between job involvement and organizational commitment. Another meta-analytic study demonstrated a correlation of 0.20 between job commitment and job performance. Here in slide 6, you can see items pertaining to the Organizational Commitment Questionnaire. In slide 7, there is a concentric model of work commitment, where work ethic is located at the center of the model where occupational commitment lies next to it. Next comes continuous organizational commitment. Next to it is affective organizational commitment. And in the final layer is job involvement. As you can see, organizational commitment is in essence multidimensional. Each dimension can be very important in the process of analyzing attitudes and work behaviors. Organizational justice. Organizational justice is concerned with the fair treatment of people in organizations. It can be thought of as mere limited application of social justice, a concept that has been debated by philosophers 400 years. All organizational contents have competing goals and objectives. As an example, in personal selection, job applicants seek employment within an organization. The organization 
in return offers employment to some applicants and denies the opportunity to others. Both the outcome of the selection decision and the process can be questioned in terms of fairness. Organizational justice is a useful concept to examine a wide range of important organizational issues. Various configurations or typologies of organizational justice has been proposed over the years. Work organizations are highly sensitized to the issue of fairness and have developed mechanisms to ensure that conditions in the workplace are fair. Organizational justice and organizational commitment. Distributive justice. Distributive justice refers to the fairness of the outcomes, results, or ends achieved. Like all forms of justice, is heavily predicated upon values. These values are the rules or standards by which judgments of fairness are rendered. Three such rules have been identified as the basis for distributive justice, equity, equality, and need. Equity. The equity distribution rule suggests that people should receive rewards that are consistent with the contributions they make or bring to a situation. Equality. The equality distribution rule suggests that all the individuals should have an equal chance of receiving the outcome or reward. The quality rule suggests that developmental training recipients should be selected randomly. Need. The need rule distribution that rewards should be distributed on the basis of individual need. A special considerations that the needy individual receive is thus perceived as fair. Procedural justice. The second major type of justice is procedural justice, which is the fairness of the means used to achieve the results. As the name suggests, it deals with the perceived fairness of the policies and procedures used to make decisions. In essence, the distinction between distributive and procedural justice is the difference between content and process that is basic to many philosophical approaches to study justice. There are two dimensions to conceptualizing procedural justice. One emphasizes the role of the individual voice in the process. Procedures are perceived to be more fair when affected individuals have an opportunity to either influence the decision process or offer input. The second dimension emphasizes the structural component of the process whereby procedural justice is a function of the extent to which procedural rules are satisfied or violated. These procedural rules are satisfied or violated. These procedural rules suggest that decisions should be made consistently without personal biases, with as much accurate information as possible, and with an outcome that could be modified. To judge a process in terms of fairness, the following six criteria should be used. One, consistent. Two, bias-free. Three, accurate. Four, correctable in case of error. Five, representative of all concern. And six, based on prevailing ethical standards. Interactional justice, a third major type of organizational justice has been identified, referred to as interactional justice. In turn, interactional justice has two components, interpersonal and informational. Interpersonal justice is manifest by showing concern for individuals and respecting them as people who have dignity. Ostensible displays of politeness and respect for citizens right enhance their perception of fair treatment by authorities such as police and the courts. 
Informational justice is manifested by providing knowledge about procedures that demonstrate regard for people's concern. People are given adequate accounts and explanations of the procedures used to determine desired outcomes. For explanations to be perceived as fair, they must also be recognized as genuine intent and based on sound reasoning. A major meta-analytic review of 25 years of organizational justice research concluded that distributive justice, procedural justice, and the two types of interactional justice each contribute incremental variance to perceptions of fairness in the workplace. Another factor that is related to justice and has been recently studied by EO psychologists is organizational citizenship behavior. Organizational researchers discovered that some employees contribute to the welfare or effectiveness of the organization by going beyond the duties prescribed in their jobs. That is, they give extra discretional contributions that are neither required nor expected. The most frequently used term for this phenomenon is organizational citizenship behavior. It is also referred to as prosocial behavior, extra role behavior, and contextual behavior. Five dimensions to citizenship behavior has been supported by empirical research. First is altruism, which call helping behavior. Altruism reflects willfully helping a specific people with an organizational relevant task or problem. Consciousness is the second one which refers to being punctual, having attendance better than the group norm, judiciously following company rules, regulation, and procedures. Number third is courtesy. Courtesy is being mindful and respectful of other people's rights. Number four is sportsmanship. Sportsmanship refers to avoiding complaints petty grievances, gossiping, and falsely magnifying problems. Number five, civic virtue. Civic virtue is responsive participation to the political life of the organization. Civic virtue reflects keeping abreast of not only current organizational issues, but also mundane issues such as attending meetings, attending to in-house communications, and speaking up issues. Employees who have exhibited prosocial behavior are highly valued by their managers. Indeed, they should be because they contribute above and beyond the normal requirements and expectations of the job. Meta-analytic studies demonstrate correlations of citizenship behaviors and unit productions of 0.42 and 0.41 with cost reduction. A second explanation for organizational citizenship behaviors, situational antecedents, has is basic the concept of organizational justice. It is proposed that if employees believe they are treated fairly, then they are more likely to hold positive attitudes about their work. Fairness perceptions may influence prosocial behavior by prompting employees to define their relationship with the organization as a social exchange. Studies show that organizational citizenship behavior was related to perception of procedural justice but not distributive justice. Furthermore, the courtesy dimension of citizenship was most strongly related to procedural justice. Another finding is that supervisors can directly influ influence employees' citizenship behavior. The psychological contract. The psychological contract is the exchange relationship between the individual employee and the organization. It is not 
a formal written contract between the individual employee and the organization, but an implied relationship based on mutual contributions. The psychological contract is the employee's perception of the reciprocal obligations that exist within the organization. The employees have beliefs about the organization's obligations to them as well as their obligations to the organization. The psychological contract is used to explain employment behaviors in two ways. By exploring how reciprocal promises oblique employee behavior to do things for their employer and considering how employees react when they believe promises made to them are broken. The psychological contract is founded in two principles, mutuality, the extent to which workers and employees share beliefs about specific terms of the exchange and reciprocity, their commitment to each other. Psychological contracts are transactional in short frames of time or relational characterized by long-term relationships. There is an element of power in all contrast. Power can be distributed either equally between the two parties or unequally. Asymmetrical power is most common in employment relationships. Power asymmetrics affect the perceived voluntariness of the exchange relationship dividing the two parties into contract makers and contract takers. As contract takers, employees cannot easily influence the employment relationship. This may result in a perceived loss of control in the relationship, which is likely to intensify feelings of mistreatment and injustice when violations are perceived. Violations of the psychological contract. The psychological contract is violated when one party in a relationship perceives that another has failed to fulfill the promised obligations. The failure of one party to meet his obligations to another can be expected to erode both the relationships and the affected party beliefs in the reciprocal obligations of the two parties. Violations by an employer may affect not only what an employee feels he or she is owned by the employer, but also what an employee feels obligated to offer in return. Violations of the psychological contract can make employees to turn away from the socio-emotional aspects of work and focus on the monetary benefits of the relationship. This has the effect of increasing the psychological distance between the employee and the employer, making the contract more transactional. Five responses to the violation of the psychological contract. Voice. In voice, employee voice their concerns over the violations and seek to reinstate the contract. Silence is the other one, which connotes compliance with the organization but loss of commitment. Retreat. Retreat is characterized by passivity, negligence, and shirking of responsibility. Destruction. Employees retaliate against the employer through theft threats, sabotage, and in extreme cases, homicide. Exit. Employee quit the organization or provoke the organization to dismiss them. As you can see in slide 9, in the nature of psychological contract, when the contract is transactional, alienation can be present with violence, threat, negligence, and negativism as antisocial behaviors. When the relation is between transactional and relational and alienation and commitment in different social behaviors will appear. One of them is compliance. 
and but um, when the contract is relational and commitment exists, you will see prosocial behavior like consciousness, sportsmanship, courtesy, civic virtue, and altruism. As you can see on a slide 11, there are some sort of types of violation of the psychological contract. And in training and development, for example, when there is absence of training or training experience, not as promised, the employee will feel that the contract was violated, probably because when he went to the employment interview, the interviewer promised the employee or the candidate promised that he or she was going to be in a lot of training. Uh, he will have opportunities of being trained on different skills and when that doesn't happen the employee will feel that the contract was violated. As an example, sales training was promised as an integral part of marketing training. It never materialized, it never happened. In the areas of compensation, when discrepancies in promise and realized pay benefits and bonuses, sometimes where you get promised that you're going to get more money for do some type of extra work or for double um, sales and you excel in your performance and you were promised that if you do that you're gonna get a reward and you don't get it you're gonna feel the contract has been violated as an example a specific compensation benefit were promised either they were not given to me or I had to fight for them in promotion promotion or advancement schedule not as promised uh, happens a lot on companies. As an example, I perceive a promise that I had a good chance of promotion to manager in one year. While I received excellence performance rating, I was not promoted in my first year. In terms of job security, promises not met regarding the degree of job security one could, could expect. The company promised that no one would be fired out of the training program, that all of us were safe until placement. In return for this security, we accepted lower pay. The company subsequently fired four people from the training program. That's an example of violations that happen when promises are made and they don't get what they were expected for. Feedback, feedback. In case of, uh, in the case of feedback, feedback and reviews in adequate compare with uh, what was promised. As an example, I did not receive performance review as promised. And in terms of people, uh, employees perceive as having misrepresented the type of people at the firm in terms of things such as their expertise, work style, or reputation. It was promised as dynamic and as having a challenging environment, rubbing elbows with some of the brightest people in the business, a lie. The true picture started to come after the initial hype of working at one of the best 100 companies in the country had worn off. Sometimes the psychological contract is also violated but by the way people play politics in the organizations. That's the next thing we will talk about, organizational politics. The concept of organizational politics is relatively new to the field of EO psychology. It seeks to explain behaviors within organizations that account for how and why decisions get made. Organizations are arenas for individual behavior to manifest itself 
and people are motivated by many factors, including self-interest. The concept of organizational politics examines how individuals use their organizational membership to enhance their self-interest. Organizational politics is the capacity and willingness of the individual within organizations to use power for the purpose of furthering their own interests and agendas. It's a self-serving behavior that may coincidentally enhance the welfare of other employees is the cornerstone of the organizational politics. It is portrayed that scholars as representing the dark side of behaviors involving tactics such as manipulation, coercion, deceit, and subversion. Henry Minsberg described different types of games being played in organizations in terms of politics. First one is the budgeted game. The budgeted game is the awarding of a value resource to a department or unit in exchange of support and compliance. Another one is the expertise game, using knowledge as a service of power to influence in decision-making processes. Another game is the rival camps. Two rival departments like production or sales form temporary alliances in exchange of value to them. The second area is devoted to understanding political skill. There are four attributes of the people who engage in political games. Social astuteness is the ability to observe social cues and to intuit the motives and values of the individuals. Interpersonal influence is the other, which is the capacity to take control of social encounters and do so with considerable ease. The other attribute is building networks and forming coalitions. A person has to know how to cultivate interpersonal resources to achieve desired outcomes. The four attributes projected virtue. Politically skilled individuals can disguise their true intentions and project themselves to others as being virtuous in their motives. Organizational politics can undermine the principle of organizational justice and a sense of fair play. When used routinely throughout the organization, it can produce feelings of cynicism and apathy among employees. Research on the relationship between perception of organizational politics and employee attitudes show correlations of 0.43 between perceived politics and the desire to leave the organization, negative 0.57 with job satisfaction and negative 0.54 with effective organizational commitment. Organizational deviance refers to a broad range of employee behaviors aimed at exacting revenge against the organization or fellow workers for some perceived injustice. The phenomenon has also been called workplace incivility, counterproductive workplace behaviors and insidious workplace behaviors. Organizational deviant behaviors can be grouped into several categories. First one is verbal behaviors, rudeness, ostracism, spreading rumors and sarcasm. Physical behaviors include bullying and over violent behavior. Sabotage can be directed toward organizational property of customers. Work directed behaviors included lateness, excessive absence, theft, and working slowly. Workplace homicide, another form of violence, is cyber aggression, which includes cyber talking, wasting time by sending personal emails, playing computer games, insulting people using email, and texts. Chapter summary individuals 
in an organizational context develop attitudes and exhibit behaviors associated with their participation in the organization. Job satisfaction is one of the most frequently studied organizational attitudes. How much people like their jobs is associated with both their individual personalities and the objective characteristics of the work they perform. The concept of organizational justice explains why employees want a sense of fairness associated with their employment. Organizational justice manifests itself in three forms, distributed, procedural, and interactional. Chapter summary continued. The action of employees in going beyond their formal job duties and responsibilities to contribute to the welfare of the organization are called organizational citizenship behaviors. The psychological contract is the exchange relationship between the individual and the organization. Although unwritten, it is based on the expectation each party has of itself and of the other party. Violations of the psychological contract for example, when one party has not lived up to the expectation of the other, result in a wide range of behavior that often distance the two parties in the relationship. Chapter summary continued. The various behavioral tactics that individuals within an organizational context use to enhance their self-interest represent organizational politics. Organizationally deviant behavior in the workplace includes insults, threats, bullying, life, theft, sabotage, physical violence, and occupational homicide. Workplace homicide, the most severe form of antisocial behavior, results in nearly 1,000 murders of workers in the United States every year.